Okay, uh, let's get started. Um, first of all, let me just explain the um, the Q&A procedure for those of you who are joining us for the first time. Um, generally, you can either use the raised hand feature in Zoom, uh, and I will call on you to uh, to unmute yourself, or you can um, type your question in the chat. In which case, I will read out your questions. <coughs> Okay, um, so yeah, so I guess let's get started. Um, so welcome to the special year seminar on theoretical machine learning at the Institute for Advanced Study. Today we are delighted to have Jennifer Liskarten as our speaker. Jennifer is a professor at the University of California, Berkeley and the Chan Zuckerberg investigator and previously spent 11 years at Microsoft Research. She has done a variety of interesting work at the intersection of machine learning and molecular biology and was behind the development of a lot of computational tools for gen genome-wide association studies and protein expression uh, profiling studies. Today, she will tell us about machine learning-based design of protein, small molecules, and beyond. Please welcome Jennifer Listgarten. Thank you. Uh, great. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm, I'm anticipating a somewhat uh, broad crowd, but I guess machine learning focused. If there are any questions, though, uh, because it's kind of an interdisciplinary talk, please don't be shy about interrupting. Um, and so this is actually a pretty new area for me that I started in around, let's say, two to three years ago. And so what I'm going to give you now is uh, is our initial work in this area and sort of the thinking on which we've anchored all of it. So, okay, so first I'm gonna start with this slightly crazy thing just to wake people up um, from too many online meetings. So this guy is in Paris and he's spending two days searching for a needle in a haystack. So, okay, why is this in my slide deck? What does this have to do with my title? Um, so, and, and actually the gallery issued a warning that this could take longer than anticipated with just two days. And so, uh, of course, the reason it's here is that there's this direct analogy to finding the proteins that we want for therapeutics for, and for other purposes, and also for small molecules and for many other things. In, in many cases, uh, searching for a design of a protein or molecule is the search through this nearly infinite discrete space. And so it is kind of this impossible problem. And in a way, the question is like, how, how well can we do um, and can we make some progress uh, nevertheless? So I'm going to anchor this talk on protein design and protein engineering because it's my maybe my main passion at the moment. But a lot of the methods that I will discuss are kind of general for general computational design uh, in a data driven manner. And I think that will become clear from the methods, but it will all be anchored on these protein examples. And I think proteins are just a really exciting domain to work in. Um, they're close to my heart because my career has mostly been in molecular biology with machine learning, but here are just a few examples of where proteins are super important. So actually on the right here, we have Rubisco, which I actually didn't know about before this work, but this is the most common enzyme in the entire world. And it's um, key in carbon fixation. And it's sort of been also typically the rate limiting uh, component of phosphorylation. And so if you could actually reduce the oxin oxygenation or um, increase the catalytic activity, this would have huge consequences um, for the planet, for climate and things like this. So that's a really big one that people haven't had much, um, made much headway into. You've probably all heard of CRISPR-Cas9 now, so I have some work on this as well I won't discuss, but the, the big sort of Pac-Man thing you see in, that's coming in here is gonna come in and cut the DNA that's gonna enable us to make all these incredible edits that are you know, slowly changing the world. And this itself is a protein and people are trying to optimize and change this protein for different purposes. Um, a, another one, we're working very closely with Dave Schaefer here at Cal on um, a particular virus that can be used to deliver a payload as a therapeutic. And getting this uh, particular virus, which is actually, as I said, a therapeutic, to the right part of the body, for example, uh, in a, is, is, is a very interesting and tricky but doable protein engineering problem. And so, and there's a, I'm not going to go into all of these, but there's, there's so many interesting, super high impact 
places where proteins touch on society um, from disease to agriculture to the basic sciences. So uh, probably most of you know that proteins are coded for by a string, a sequence um, from an alphabet of amino acids of which there are 20. And so um, if you're a more kind of mathy person, this is just gonna end up looking a lot like combinatorial optimization. But actually it's gonna be a lot more interesting and even harder than that already hard problem. But just to give you a sense of the scale of how hard it is to sort of search through protein space in some naive manner by enumeration or otherwise, um, a typical protein is, is actually more than 100 amino acids long. And you can see that already like somewhere between 50 and 100, we're getting to a number of proteins uh, of that length that rivals the number of atoms in the universe. So this is not a manageable space, no matter what kind of compute you are, whatever company you're at, um, although more compute certainly always um, is nice. So, so fundamentally, this is just like this really huge, intractable, discrete space. Um, and chemistry, so I'm not going to talk about chemistry or, or anything beyond proteins, but there is a similar story here in terms of searching through a massive space. Uh, the main difference is that you don't actually even have as nice a starting point because the representation, the very naive one, is actually this sort of 3D topology with electron densities and so forth. And so the basic representational issue is actually one of the biggest problems right now, whereas in proteins you can just kind of start with these sequences and maybe you can use deep learning or other techniques to squeeze out more meaningful representations but the starting one is just as sort of nice as say like an image of pixels and that's simply not true for chemistry but i'm not going to comment any more on that and so in what i tell you if you assume you have some starting representation then in principle you can apply everything that i'll, that I'll tell you um, Okay, so we have this huge space, but we know protein, uh, we know that nature, sorry, has managed to somehow navigate it, right? And so what you see here is what started off as a linear sequence. Um, this is using a sort of schematic people use in, in proteins for the, the local structure along that string, but that local structure is gonna fold up into a 3D structure. Um, in this case, this is actually a protein that was, um, whose discovery and development um, in a jellyfish was awarded the, the Nobel Prize in 2008. And so there's this idea that nature knows this, despite that this is sort of hundreds of amino acids long, it somehow figured out that in a, a way that actually gets it to fold up in this very specific way that actually enables it to fluoresce um, in that central part. And so kind of the idea here is now that we're able to measure properties of proteins at scale sometimes, but not always, and similarly for chemistry, can we use this, these collected data to somehow either like say match um, nature when nature hasn't quite gotten us maybe it, taken a path we, that it could have taken and then better still, can we actually beat it? Can we do things faster than what evolution has done? And so those are kind of in some sense, the, the, my, my central questions for proteins. And um, I think the, the answer is probably already yes to the first one as I'll explain. And I, I think we're on our way to the second one, but that, the, that remains to be seen. Um, I'll just pause briefly here, even though I don't feel like I've said too much. Are there any basic questions um, about anything so far? If anyone has any questions, feel free to use the raise hand feature or type them in the chat box. Okay, I'll, I'll keep going. Um, so, okay. So what I mentioned this, this encoding of proteins. And so you don't really need to know the details for this talk. You can just think there are these 20 letters and I put them together in a string, but it, it's kind of just interesting to note that actually each of these amino acids is encoded for by three nucleotides, a triplet of nucleotides. And this is actually a redundant encoding. So for example, here, this particular amino acid arginine, ARG represented by an R, um, has, uh, you can code it in two different ways, GGA or AGA. And in general, there's two to five different ways you can use the nucleotides to code for each amino acid. And, and so there's sort of a bit of a story behind perhaps why evolution led to this redundant encoding. But in any case, what I've actually displayed here on the background is two axes of a variational autoencoder which if you're not familiar with is sort of like a nonlinear probabilistic principal components analysis. And each axis is one of the latent dimensions. 
if I pick a point in latent space, what I show you is the maximal decoding into a codon there, um, and the, the intensity is the probability. And so we don't actually really use that, but it's sort of a beautiful picture. And I think it just gets at this idea that evolution has created informative structure in these massive combinatorial spaces. And the idea, of course, <laughs> since I do machine learning and statistics is to understand how we might extract that in, in useful ways for problems like protein engineering. And in, of course, the rest of my career, I did a lot of statistical genetics and, and many other things for which you, this is also the motivation. Um, Oh, I think I have two of those in there somehow. Okay, so right. So how before I go into how we think about it, a good starting point is to say, how are people doing it now? And so there are actually different techniques, but I would argue that maybe the most, um, the one that's actually producing the most results is the one I'm going to tell you about. Uh, and it's the one we kind of anchor our thinking on as well. And so this is uh, called directed evolution, and it got the Nobel Prize in chemistry uh, 10 years after GFP. Um, Francis Arnold was among the winners. Um, and so it's actually very, very intuitive if you haven't seen it before. So, and there's nothing computational here. This is purely a wet lab experiment. And so point number one is you need to have some protein, what we call the parent, which has at least a hint of an element of the thing you want. So if you want a protein that fluoresces, you're going to have to find one that fluoresces at least a little bit. And so that's actually a major constraint, right? Um, nevertheless, uh, it, it, we, we have used this in society um, for in science to, to do all kinds of wonderful things. Given that parent, you then induce a diversification step so that the parent has a, now a variant of itself, a whole pool of these that differ in some way. And typically this is done, well, it's always a random sort of stochastic process. Um, sometimes it's sort of unif almost random uh, uniform along the sequence. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details here unless someone has questions, but there are different mechanisms you can use to induce this. But roughly speaking, you, what you should think of is that for each of these variants in the pool, I took the parent and at some number, a random number of places in the parent, um, uh, uh, and then I randomly mutated the nucleotide to a different nucleotide. And then, I, and then what happens is I need some ability to screen for the thing I care about, like fluorescence. Uh, fluorescence is easy because you can just measure um, how bright something is, but often you want to measure something like how well it binds to a target. And then you need to be super clever to develop a proxy in the laboratory to measure that. And actually, in the type of work Francis um, does, this is a basically the, the, the limiting step and they can only measure a few hundred things. But in the kind of work that say Dave Schaefer does on, on gene delivery, you can get 10 to the six measurements in one go. And so this is very domain specific what the numbers look like. But in any case, then what you do is uh, you, take, you take the top performing ones according to the screen and you repeat. And so, of course, this is very much like evolution in that the fittest things survive and keep going through the cycle. And moreover, there's this sort of random diversification step. And the reason it's, of course, directed is that you're the one deciding what the fitness is. And that's the sense in which it's directed. And so, of course, what I'm going to tell you about is how can we start to think about this more computationally and what are the opportunities here um, to interact with this kind of procedure that might accelerate it or take it to a better place. Um, and so aspirationally, we might think that we could replace it one day, but I think we're always going to want to work synergistically with it. And, and I think in general, that's always going to be true in the sciences. We're not going to just get rid of any of the wet labs. So, okay, so the sort of very first obvious thing, you know, like, um, you know, if you read a New York Times piece about machine learning, you'd say, oh, well, maybe I build a predictive model, right? Because that's sort of the commodity, easy thing to do at this point. And so the place you would obviously do that here is you might say, if I had some data from screening, maybe I take those data and I replace the assay, the thing that measures in the lab with a predictive model. Um, and so indeed we are going to do that. I don't think that's the most interesting place uh, sort of from an intellectual academic perspective, but it will certainly be required. And at times people may give us such models that already exist. They could be physics based, they could be um, machine learning based. And then what I think I would argue we're more interested in is now combining that with some way of searching through the space more intelligently given such a model. 
And that's going to be sort of the central focus of this talk rather than building the model. So we're going to assume we're in a place where somehow we have a model that's roughly good enough that it should be able to help us. And you might ask, how could you characterize that? And that in itself is an interesting question we haven't fully answered yet, but let's assume we're in that scenario. And so, right, so basically what this is from a computational perspective is a random greedy search. And so it stands to reason we could do something better here and that maybe that's where the real opportunity lies. Okay, so, um, so let's think, I'm gonna call, the, the fact that we are gonna replace the screening procedure with a predictive model, I'm gonna refer to this as our oracle. And it is, it's gonna be a predictive model. It, in fact, as you'll see, it can be a black box model, but it, just for um, visual reasons, I've drawn it here as a neural network, which is of course not a black box. And uh, normally, of course, what you do is you get a pair of, of say, sequences um, X paired with some properties you care about. And then the idea normally would be that you tune the weight, the parameters using some procedure like SGD on the loss to, to find the best setting of the Ws. But in this setting, we're going to assume that it's already been given to us and we want to kind of turn it on its head or invert it. And so we want to specify various um, sort of properties here and maybe we want to maximize one subject to that another one is high enough or we want to minimize one but we can sort of abstract away from that and in general we just i'm going to talk here about maximizing a single property um, but you can generalize it in the way i just described and then the idea will be that once you've set the criteria here you want to go back and find um, a set of x's that are likely to correspond to that uh, if you just find one, uh, it, this is uh, going to be imperfect. Machine learning is never perfect, so your odds are you're, you're not going to do well. So you really do want to find a set of things here. And uh, even though I would say in a lot of modern day machine learning, where people tend to ignore um, calibrated losses uh, or uncertainty on the predictive models, this is of course going to be very important here because the uncertainty at this is going to have some effect on what we find at the input. So, right, so just to make sure, I'm, like I'm gonna try kind of say the same thing several times over to make sure everyone understands the setup. So the idea here is that given the ability to predict a property from a sequence, so maybe the fluorescence from the DNA or the amino acids, we are looking for a method that's gonna tell us what sequences to choose to say maximize a property. That's the goal that we have here. And we probably are gonna need to um, also handle constraints of this design problem. It could be that actually maybe we don't want to change the amino acids. Maybe we only want to change the nucleotides subject to that code, the redundant code. Maybe we are willing to change the amino acids. That's the more likely one, but maybe we want to keep some certain local structures fixed and not change them uh, and things like this. So that's the general setup. Are there any questions here? If there are any questions, please raise your hands or type your questions in the chat box. <laughs> okay, I guess it's crystal clear. Okay. <laughs> um, great, so, right, and now I just put a black box around here to say that actually we also um, have a goal that we want this um, procedure to only require a black box here. And that's kind of because in any case, we're doing design in a discrete space, and so gradients aren't really going to be very helpful anyway, although some people are arguing that you might want to think of it that way. I don't think that that's particularly helpful. Um, um, so and we have a question from Rohit's Goswami. Okay. If you can unmute yourself, that would be great. Uh, yeah, so I was just wondering whether the current um, like focus is on finding better parameters to describe the space better, um, like the space of all possible proteins, or is it more about um, classifying which ones are fit for a particular purpose? So there's an, I, I'll maybe rephrase the question, um, which is I think maybe what you're like, so there's different components here. One is, is there a good representation of proteins that's useful? and you, that you might want to use that to search through instead of the sort of naive amino acid space. And so, yeah, that is, that is something people are thinking of and it will come into this talk and it comes into other people's talks. Um, and then what was the, I think that was sort of one thing I internalized from your question, but, um, what we, and then you were saying, oh, and then 
the, I guess the other issue is this regression model, the predictive model, um, which I, I wanna, it's regression, not um, classification. And so I, definitely people are chasing how to do better on those models in particular domains. And probably you could spend a PhD in some of those, um, although it probably wouldn't be a computer science PhD, but those are very, it, that's also a very important problem and it, but it's not the focus of our, of our work. Okay. Um, so right, so the, the, the sort of goals that we have in the setup here is we wanna uh, be able to absorb a black box oracle we want to account for uncertainty of the Oracle predictive model because that's surely going to be important. And we'd like to provide a set of good candidates, um, not just one to hedge our bets. So the approach we took is one that um, we, and I guess some people call model-based optimization. This is kind of a strange area because it, it sort of appears in different <laughs> ways um, in different communities that seem mostly to be unaware of each other. So. I'll give you kind of my view of this, which is maybe a synthesis of some of these areas that normally we think of optimization as say, X is the space of sequences. So this would be a protein um, described by its amino acid sequence and maybe F is the property I'm trying to maximize, right? And so this would be the standard way that you would think of just writing down what it, an optimization problem is. And the way we think of it and, and other people and I can, I'll explain in a moment why we think of it this way, is that instead of searching through the space of sequences, we're gonna actually search over um, a model over the space of sequences. So we're gonna actually search over theta, which parameterizes a, a density, if you will, over the sequences. And so you can think of this as gonna be sort of like a spotlight in the design space that's centered somewhere and has some mass um, extending out, and we're going to kind of move that spotlight through the space iteratively until it lands in a region that satisfies what we're hoping to find, or this is the goal at least. And so that's that's what we call model-based optimization, where we replace the sort of space of sequences with the space of models. And so, like, why do we do that? There's a number of reasons. One is that the model can kind of now, as I said, it's like a search, search if you will, and it can sample broad areas of the sequence space. And so somehow it gets to touch more of the space than say a particle in gradient descent. Uh, it does not require gradients of F. Even if you take the gradient of this thing, it, it turns out the gradient of F does not appear in that. Um, and, and actually we don't just take the gradient of the thing. You can uh, incorporate uncertainty by making this actually like a cumulative density function. Um, and when you're done, this sort of spotlight is in some particular part of the space and now you can just sample from it. Uh, and if you want, you could impose some entropy constraints and things like this so that it doesn't collapse to a point distribution if you don't want it to, although, although I'm not gonna talk about that. But I would argue that the most important thing that won't be obvious at the moment is that I've actually somehow now just introduced the language of probability into optimization, which is actually kind of weird if you think about it. And, uh, and we sort of stumbled into this and realized that it was useful to reason about how to um, hedge our bets in this space, because ultimately this game is going to be about um, thinking about how far can I extrapolate or not into a space. But, but we'll, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, but let's just say that the fact that I've introduced the language of probability and optimization is actually very, very powerful. So our aim is going to be to use this kind of an approach to solve the problem I described. And here, um, let's see, do I, ha I have it written out, right? So this is what the spotlight thing we often call the search model. And so it could be a variational autoencoder over a discrete space. It could be an HMM. If you happen to be in a domain where you have mixed like hybrid and uh, a mixed uh, discrete and continuous, you could you know, do, do that in here with a suitable model. Or if it's purely uh, continuous, this could be actually a Gaussian it is a very common choice, but it could be more. And now this is, S is the desired set of property values. So it might be say the fluorescence is higher than some value, um, maybe the max value. Um, and, and this is sort of what we call, and it, this is an integration over the Oracle regression model. Um, and so it's sort of the, the CDF, if you will, which, which also accounts therefore um, for the uncertainty in, in that that model has. And so this is our model-based optimization objective. And so I'm not going to sort of go into too much nitty gritty, but I'm just going to highlight that some of the technical aspects that make this challenging are common to things you may have seen in machine learning. So the fact that theta is in the distribution of the expectation is a problem we see that sometimes is, is tackled with the reparameterization trick and other such things. 
um, what we actually do is we end up creating, we end up bounding it and maximizing a lower bound that, that in fact satiates, uh, which actually ties it to, to expectation maximization, which I'll briefly mention after, and it is in a preprint, actually now a paper, I guess. Um, and so that's a pretty common one. The second one that I think you see much less frequently in machine learning is that you now end up with a Monte Carlo estimate for um, something that has rare events. And, and what that ends up doing is that the, the weights in the Monte Carlo estimate are naively very, very, very small, like infinitesimal. And so you're basically screwed um, because you're gonna get like nearly infinite variance. And so you need to do something about that and so we were inspired by, um, you may have heard of the cross entropy method where they t uh, sort of do a sequence of relaxations. And so that's what we do. At an intuitive level, what that means is if I'm seeking very high fluorescence, initially I reduce that, I relax it and say like, well, let me just find something that's a little bit higher than what I've seen and slowly crank that up. And by virtue of doing that, we can control the variance in the, in the Monte Carlo estimate here. So I'm not going to say more about the sort of derivation of this, but what's kind of cool is like we, we sort of did this, if you will, from sort of first principles of statistical modeling. And what's kind of very satisfying is what emerges is an algorithm that feels very much like directed evolution, but it's in silico. And so I'm just going to walk you through that, uh, the intuition. So there's a procedure here. And it requires that we have this oracle that's already been trained and has uncertainty. And this is basically the point estimate. And this is the CDF so that we can account for the uncertainty. We require um, a, an ability to train some generative model, which will be that search model, like a, we use often a variational autoencoder. And it needs to be able to take weighted samples. Um, and then we need that sort of parent distribution um, that directed evolution took. Like with some initialization is a good idea. If we don't, we can still run this. It may take longer to converge and it may not converge to as good of a place. Uh, of course, this is at the end of the day, non-convex optimization. And so in some sense, all bets are off, but basically that's all real world interesting problems, right? So well, most of them. Okay, so that's what the procedure takes. And then I'm not gonna show you this like really cute mapping that, that just emerged was not our goal and makes me very happy. Um, and so if you have an initialization set, then you just take it. If you don't, then you randomly, randomly initialize the proteins. And, and we do more than one. We have like a population um, that's sort of the size of the variant pool. And, and at each round, we just have a new population. And then we assign equal weights um, in the absence of any more information to all of the things in the initial pool. And then we're going to cycle through the way directed evolution does until some convergence criteria. And so what we're going to do is we're going to train the search model, the generative model, like a VAE, uh, with the, the initialization and the weights. And then we're going to sample from it. And when we sample from it, this is kind of a very key uh, concept here, is because it's very much like the diversification step. But it's different in the sense that if we've done a good job at selecting a proper model class and trained it well, then the idea is that when in inducing diversification here, we should be doing it in a way that's sort of smarter for searching around the space because it's aware of how things co-vary with each other, how different amino acids co-vary and other such things. And so I think this is one of the reasons here that we should hope to do better in searching through the space is because we hope to understand some structure with good modeling at this part. So now we've been done the diversification step now, I'm not gonna go through the nitty gritty of this, but basically we screen it in silico by using the Oracle and its uncertainty. And instead of indirected evolution, where we just toss out the bottom half and keep the top half equally, here we have a more nuanced weighting scheme um, that's going to allow us to retain all of the samples, but with different effects. And then we're gonna just cycle through here. And so, um, so two things are kind of happening is one, we're inducing a smarter uh, way to induce diversification. Two, we have a, not just a hard truncation of what we keep. And three, we're searching through the space of the generative model, not the sequences. And so that could actually be a much more and hopefully should be a much more effective way to search through the space for various reasons, although we don't sort of have any theory on that. It's something we're still thinking about. So, so that's kind of key cute and, and useful. Um, and well, maybe I'll just pause quickly uh, here again. Are there any questions? <laughs> 
So Jennifer, we do have uh, three questions that are, uh, that are related to the uh, motivation slide that you showed earlier. Um, mm -hmm. So if you can go back to the last motivation slide, there was a bottom right panel. Um, I don't know what motivation slide is, but something oh, back here? This one, yeah, exactly. Um, no, the this next one. one. Ah, yeah. okay. So there's that panel there, and we have a question from Mohamed Rezai, um, who asked if you can elaborate on that. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, I guess I tweak my talks all the time and sometimes don't talk. This is, so um, that GFP protein is a fluorescent protein that's used all over the world. Like, and, like it has a huge impact, which is why I got the Nobel Prize. And it's been, it's been engineered to death. So this is showing different things. You, you might want to change the wavelength at which it fluoresces. And so this kind of shows you different, uh, different versions of that same protein that fluoresce at different wavelengths. And people also try to make it fluoresce more. So there's this like super fluorescent green protein. And it's a good sort of model system, if you will, if you're interested in doing protein engineering and design like this, because there are data uh, for it quite a bit. It's fairly well understood and, uh, and the data is publicly available. So, uh, so it's a nice model system and it, it is actually just a super important protein as well. Okay. Okay. And the next question is from Anurab. Um, the question is how helpful in general are the standing natural generic variation when building predictive models? How, how what, say that again? How helpful in general uh, are standing ge natural generic variations when building a predictive model? I actually don't understand the question. Maybe if I read it, as, um, uh, how am I looking? How helpful are the standing natural genetic var I don't, I guess I don't understand the question, so I can't answer that one. Um, okay. So the next question is from Rohit Goswami um, and who asks, uh, very generally, is the interest currently in obtaining parameters or uh, is the focus on classification? Oh, sorry, this was answered previously. I'm, I'm so sorry, it got sent late. All right. Um, next question is from AK. Um, so are the candidate sequences generated based off of a pool of good sequences um, that you already have? Are the candidate sequences generated? Are the candidate sequences generated based on? Ah, uh, I see. So, so all right. I, what always happens when I give this talk is I get a lot of questions of specifics, and a lot of times what I say is it's really like I'm giving you, I'm painting you an overview that's going to need to be instantiated in different ways for different problems, and I like, but I want to give the kind of clear, more abstract overview of this. So in general, you would probably start off that search model by uh, seeding it with the, the sequences you have. So if you have a bunch of things related to GFP and you were trying to engineer GFP, you would probably start it with that. Or actually, as we'll get to with um, maybe if you did train your own predictive model, whatever you trained it with, you might seed the search model just with those. So it starts where it kind of knows something. Yeah. But at the moment, I'm sort of glossing over these, but they're, of course, very important questions. And, and, and we have answers to them. I just can't go into every detail for this talk. And I think there's, there's more interesting things to say. OK. The next question is Michael Nissan. Um, the question is, can you explain again, uh, what is the smart weighting of the screening one more time? Uh, so I, oh, I didn't explain it. It's very nuanced, but roughly speaking, the weighting is that the better you are according to the predictive model, the higher a weight you'll get. And then that gets mitigated somewhat by the uncertainty of the predictive model. Um, yeah. Um, next question is from Rohit again. Um, the question is, is there any effect of the system itself um, to the general gener model discussed in the design by adaptive sampling slides. Is and the system, I guess, refers to biologically motivated changes. The effect of the system itself to the generative model. I suppose if you were to use the methods of um, you know, designing uh, uh, Actually, I'm not sure. Hey, Rohe, if you can just unmute um, yourself and explain uh, what you meant. Oh, actually, uh, so that was better asked by Istvan in the next question. Like, what are the constraints which, which are being added to this search model? 
Yeah, so again, that's going to depend a lot on the problem. Um, and so it could be that you don't want to change some things like it. And you can add that in in different ways. You can add that in actually into the generative model. You can add it in to the predict like as a sort of an, an additional oracle that basically says you satisfy the constraint or not, or how much you probabilistically satisfy the constraint. So there's a number of ways you can do that. And, and I'm, I'm, yeah, I apologize. There's just there's too many things to say. So I'm, I'm glossing over that, but it it's quite easy to put it in there in, in different ways. Okay, and the last question is from Jerome Klubiana. Um, the question is, how do you control the diversity of the Jerome model? Um, how do you prevent the Jerome model from collapsing to the sequence of high spin? Yeah, so, and actually one thing I didn't say is I, I showed this, um, how you go from sort of thinking regular optimization to model-based optimization. What I didn't say is that these are actually completely equivalent formulations of the problem when the capacity of the search model is high enough to put a point mass on the optimum, then they're actually the same. If it's not have has if it does not have that capacity, then it may not actually get and it doesn't or you don't wait long enough, it won't get to a point distribution. But indeed, in principle, you should often get to a point distribution. Um, but you and actually we haven't had to do this, so I I guess it's sort of like a notion of, well, hmm. Um, we need to look a little bit more into this, but you can put in an entropy regularization. Actually, we have done this in one of our collaborations and you can build kind of like a, um, yeah, you, you, can, you can do an entropy regularization where you just add a term and then you might ask, how do I set that? And, and that's another topic and that's sort of actually unpublished work that I don't want to talk about right now. <laughs> Sorry. All right, thank you very much. Okay. Those are all the questions. All right, let me go back to... Uh, there we go. Um, so, right. Okay. So, right. So now I sort of did this, um, this setup and I showed you that you get this iterative algorithm, which makes use of this predictive model to search through the space. And that all sounds, um, and, and, and so actually it looks like what we ended up doing, we didn't know, but we'd never heard of this. There's some class of algorithms called estimation of distribution algorithms, which are actually very powerful in many other disciplines, although it seems most computer scientists have not heard of them. And they're actually kind of the modern day equivalent of these icky things, or what I was taught were icky, which is evolutionary algorithms. Um, and so this is sort of the first paper, Baluja and Caruana, who said like, actually, like there's kind of a more principled way to do this, you, this evolutionary thing, which dictate, or it, you kind of just impose like these weird mutation moves and crossover moves, and it's, it's rather ad hoc. And so in some sense, when you train a generative model and you sample from it, you're kind of replacing that ad hoc um, mess, if you will, with something that's a bit more coherent probabilistically. And this is what are called estimation of distribution algorithms. They're related to the cross entropy method and rare event estimation. Um, and there uh, a particular instantiation is the covariance matrix adaptation estimation. And so we actually have a print, uh, oh, actually, I guess it was just accepted. In, um, at, uh, we have a preprint out that actually goes into quite some detail how you can map this class at a large set of these algorithms to actually Monte Carlo expectation maximization. And you might have actually seen that at like in your head when I was describing this sort of in silico directed evolution. It actually has a little bit of a feel of expectation maximization, which is what made us kind of chase, chase that down. And um, interestingly, this whole setup also kind of has ties to reinforcement learning, which is of course used in robotics. And so actually Sergey Levine, my colleague, who's, who's very deeply in the deep reinforcement learning and I are now kind of writing grants and brainstorming together, um, just because it turns out there's a lot of um, the technical underpinnings of the problems I care about are, are overlapping with his, which, is, <laughs> which really surprised me. Um, and it's also kind of tied to image generation um, as well, like conditional image generation, conditional VAEs, some of the technical underpinnings in there are, are similar to this as well. Um, but so, okay, so I've told you this, what seems like this clean kind of story, although I didn't sort of show you that we, you know, developed a new protein, but, uh, but before even going there, you might ask, as you should, like, well, what could go wrong here in this really nice, pretty computer science setup? And so you, you probably um, thought of it already. Um, so basically, and everything I told you, I said we're accounting for the uncertainty, but I'm somehow assuming that that uncertainty is 
properly modeled, right? That it's like exactly calibrated or well calibrated or reasonably well calibrated. And that's probably, and you know, if you're a Gaussian process regression person, you know, you like to draw these curves that always nicely show that the, it tightens up near the data and then it's wider further away from the data. But in reality, like once you get away from the training data, it's kind of all bets are off on even the uncertainty estimates. And I think you're kind of fooling yourself if you rely on them far from the data. I mean, maybe there's some settings with some particular kernels or modeling where it's more reliable, but in general, like that's not, um, that's not a solved problem. And, and it's clear to see in the sense that if you could get good, you know, to the, sense, to the extent that your model is biased um, away from the ground truth as you go further out, which it obviously is going to be because you can't extrapolate indefinitely, then it's guaranteed that your uncertainty is similarly off. So, so we sort of swept that under the rug and, and we realized that pretty quickly. And so I'm not gonna throw out everything I'm gonna, that I just told you, that still actually is the core foundation of how we think about it. But now I'm gonna layer on some other stuff here that I think is going to help us substantially. And so, but first what I wanna just highlight is to, I'm sure um, most of you on the call here are well aware of these sort of pathologies or adversarial examples that emerge from modern day machine learning uh, predictive networks, even though people keep trying to, you know, hammer them down and, and get rid of this. Fundamentally, there's sort of all these black holes is what I, how I think of them in neural networks that um, adversarial examples demonstrate the existence of. And so the setting I'm in is not adversarial, but it certainly is going to find these weird black holes because we're pushing these Oracle predictive models to their limits well outside the training data, right? And so almost by definition, we're gonna, even though we're not um, systematically trying to find adversarial things like it's going to happen just by virtue of the way the problem is set up. And just to, in case you haven't heard of these, right? So the idea is that you have this like really highly predictive neural network model that's been trained on gobs of data that does super well at predicting, you know, what kind of traffic sign it is. And then with a tiny like little, you know, gradient step in a particular direction that you don't have to think too hard about, you can often create an image that looks perceptibly basically identical, but now is like with strong, um, certainty misclassified, like it, now the model thinks it's a yield sign. And so basically what that means is that you have this highly over-parameterized space of the neural network. It's sitting at a point where it tends to do well, but if you, if you try to use it in some part of the space it's, it, that it wasn't trained on, uh, then there's a high probability that, that it's going to just do completely crazy things. So, and we're going to have to deal with that. And that's something that so far I've ignored. Okay. So, just to highlight what's gonna happen, people actually do, again, something similar in, in um, computer vision, where they say, well, suppose I've built a network to predict like different fruits, and I wanna know what the neural network thinks a banana looks like. Um, what I can do is I can set the banana node to a one, set apple, orange, everything else to zero, and then I can back propagate to set the value of X given that I have fixed Ws and say, what does that look like? So I start with a random image. I do this gradient descent to get this. And what I end up with this like mess of banana soup, right? And basically this is like in spirit, the same thing we're trying to do for protein design. We're trying to set a property here, a banana, and then we're gonna go back. And, and again, this is just highlighting that these networks may be highly accurate, but they don't understand anything and, they're, and it's complete nonsense, right? Like if this is my protein therapeutic, like good luck. It's, you know, um, it's probably like drinking chlorine. So we don't wanna do that. And that's basically the setting we're in right now. So, and in some sense, this is kind of the impossible problem of extrapolation, right? And, and so I think it is an impossible problem and always the real interesting, impactful problems on society are things that are impossible, but we say, well, what can we do and still make some progress? And so that's how I think about it. And so now we add in this sort of fourth goal here is to account for the fact that the Oracle may be arbitrarily biased or pathological. And so what can we do in the face of this problem? Because if we ignore it, we're going to just produce complete garbage. This is guaranteed, basically, like you, it, you may as well not do anything. Um, and so you're better off being more conservative and, and doing something like the following. So uh, basically, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but what I'm going to say is we add a layer in that makes use of the fact that the optimization is now 
as probabilistic language because we're gonna add in sort of a probabilistic trust region, um, if you will, that says you can't kind of go too far away from where we believe probabilistically the model understands the space. And that's gonna be where it was trained um, or based on some prior information. So in this case, if this is like a chemistry example, if, you know, if we know it was trained in this part of the space, we're basically gonna build a density model P of X over the training data and layer that into the kind of routine or methodology that I just described in a, in a coherent manner. Although I'm not, I'm not gonna go through the details. I just wanna give you that intuition. Um, and when you, if you don't have access to the training data, then you can use prior knowledge. So you could imagine downloading all proteins that are just known to fold into a big, like a 3D structure, which is already not most proteins and use that as sort of a prior of where you trust the model. Um, so, right. Uh, I'm not going to go too much, but into this, but what happens when you layer that P of X in is you had a predictive model. Now you're kind of bringing in um, a density. And so now you're kind of modeling the joint, roughly speaking, as a way to think about it. Um, there's different ways to think about it. I'm not gonna go into too much detail because I'm, I'm running out of time and I just wanna get to a few other things. But let's, uh, what I do wanna say is that um, this was the previous formulation. And in this new formulation, what we end up doing is basically saying, I wanna model a particular conditional density. Um, on the property I, I seek, the properties I seek given um, my training data, and I'm gonna estimate that with a new parameter theta. Then I'm gonna go through, and basically what I'm gonna get is an update that looks a lot like it's still iterative, so at each, and it still actually maps to an expectation maximization. But what happens is now, the tr this is almost the same update, but it gets modulated by a ratio here, which is the ratio of where essentially the density of the search model is, relative to the training data or this sort of prior density. And so it sort of um, modulates itself with a probabilistic trust region is, is how I think about it. And so you might say, well, um, now you can't go too far away. So how can you have any success? And that is sort of the, the, the magic we need to understand better is basically how far away can we go? Like what's the risk benefit analysis here? And I think there remains probably some interesting work to do there for theoreticians or practical um, empirics driven people as well. So, okay, so that's um, kind of where we are and I'm gonna, I'm gonna add one more twist to it in a minute, but um, so, which I added in just, uh, just yesterday. So I realize now maybe these should have been reshuffled a bit, but I just wanna point out that also there is, there has been a little bit of work on this in the literature and typically what people do is they assume that the Oracle model is correct and then they compare different methods. And if you do that, you're basically just saying, how well does my optimization scheme work? And you're basically being an optimization person. And I think frankly, that that's almost entirely useless and we should either do research in optimization or we should acknowledge like this is a scientific problem for which that Oracle is not correct and try to think more deeply about how to handle that and in particular even how to assess it short of going to the lab. And so this is actually really hard to deal with as a computational person without a wet lab. I mean we're working with people so these things will eventually be tested or, or actually we have already ordered stuff so it's, it's, it's happening now but um, you know and if you're trying to test a predictive model, you can always hold out part of the data and test it and get a pretty good idea. And yeah, that does assume the distribution's the same and things like this, but like it's reasonably easy to get some sort of sanity checks, right? But here you can't hold anything out because the idea is that we're going to parts of the space we've never seen. And so trying to um, assess this in silico is, is very, very challenging. And basically what we do is we create, do I have a, a slide? Right, I, I, again, I'm not, I'm just gonna kind of gloss over this. This is a one um, simple sort of sim one dimensional example we use to try to understand things and then we have more realistic ones as well. But basically we simulate the ground tooth, truth by training on real data like a GFP fluorescence data set. And we train say a Gaussian process on it. And then we treat that as the ground truth. And then we sample from that as though that is like physics. And so we have to go through this sort of extra layer of creating a ground truth and then sampling from it and then building an Oracle and things like this. And so it's kind of messy and you can only guess about how much that pertains to actual real scientific like protein fitness values, but it, it's sort of the best we can do. And at least we're, we're doing it, which is more than most people are doing.
So, right. So, and I, I don't want to, it's very, these are qu very complicated. And so I don't, like, I, I don't know that it's of that much interest to this crowd. And there is still something more interesting to say in my last few minutes. So um, I'll just say that we have various simulations, some on the 1D example where you can really see intuitively what's going on, and then another one anchored in GFP fluorescence. And then we compare to a number of different methods, um, many of which these are all model-based optimizations that yield a distribution. Um, and these are more like gradient descent um, type approaches. And basically the ones that are, are higher uh, work better and the, the, the bars have to do with the distribution. Um, and, and I'm not gonna go into it because it's just, it's just kind of torture to explain. And I don't think it's actually that exciting. You know, like anyone can write a simulation in which their method works better almost like, uh, I mean, I do think we, I mean, we, we didn't do it that way on purpose, I mean, but, um, but it is a simulation. So, okay. So, so far we've introduced a new model-based optimization method that accounts for uncertainty in the oracle and is uh, hopefully robust to pathological oracles um, from this last one. And it's sort of specifically targeted for discrete design problems, although you could apply it uh, to, to continuous ones as well. And so the but is that um, one, after this came out in ICML, um, one, of my one of my amazing students, Clara, had this um, question. She said, well, you know, this oracle model is fixed because we're not acquiring new data. Um, right, so this is not Bayesian optimization. We're not like, uh, I mean, in principle, or in, in, in reality, we may collect rounds of data, but at some point the data collection is fixed and then you have this problem I've just described. And so the idea is uh, that we're not collecting new data. But you, the question she said is like, should we maybe in any case still think about changing the Oracle as this optimization progresses, even in a fixed data setting? And so this, we just put on archive, um, earlier in June. And so Clara had this great idea to look at this and the, and the answer was yes, we should. And she had this very clever approach for doing that. Um, and so I'll just, let's see, what is the time? I have like a few minutes. Yeah, so I'm just gonna really give you a flavor of the thinking here and you can find the details there or, or ask me more about it in the questions. But just to go back to this problem is, this is this model-based optimization that I've discussed as, as a way that we're tackling it. Uh, the protein engineering or the general design problem. But, and really what we want is the true probability distribution here, right? Like according to the, like the real world, but actually all we have is an Oracle based proxy to it, what I just described. And I described some of the problems that arise from that. Uh, and so what, what she said is like, let's introduce a notion of an Oracle gap. And so the Oracle gap is basically this thing here. And it's the expectation of the difference between the two, um, the one we would like, but we cannot actually access, and the one that we actually can estimate using some oracle. And then let's actually minimize the gap. Um, can we minimize it, even though we don't have access to this? Which has a, like a little bit of feel of, of variational inference, where you also don't have the posterior you care about. So um, what ends up happening is that she, she likes to frame this as a non-zero sum game where you have these coupled objectives. And one is the objective that we had in the, in the rest of the talk, but now there's this other objective of the Oracle gap. And these are coupled to each other. And so now we're not only updating the search model um, parameters theta, we're also updating the parameters of the Oracle itself, even though we're not collecting um, new data. And the idea, the intuition here is that, again, as this sort of spotlight or search model is moving around the space, we essentially want to auto-focus the Oracle to do well in that part of the space. Um, and so, 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 yeah, I don't know. I don't have time to go maybe into these nuances, but, but let's just say um, that the way you can think about this in the end is that this is the problem I've described in the beginning of the talk. And what this thing here provides you, this Oracle gap, when you minimize it, if it's small, then it essentially provides some sort of certificate, if you will, on how much you can believe um, your objective function here. So if you're not able to, to get a small value for the Oracle gap, then it doesn't matter if think this is really high because it's not believable. And so really you want two things. You want a certificate, which you get by making the gap low, and you want this thing to be high. 
And together, if you get that, then you're, you like can start to believe that you're going to do well. And what's kind of cool is when you crank through this, like you, you develop some alternating ascent descent algorithm, which basically leverages the algorithm I just described to you, which is an estimation of distribution algorithm. Um, and then you have to be quite clever about how to minimize this Oracle gap. Uh, it ends up um, introducing an important sampling estimate. And what's kind of cool is what emerges from this, and it's sort of intuitively pleasing and in retrospect, um, obvious is actually you end up doing a covariate shift correction to the Oracle model. And the covariate shift is with respect to the search distribution. So essentially, if you know the covariate shift, um, like IWORM importance reweighted um, sort of work, this is actually what naturally emerges from the setup, which is, which is, is very satisfying. So um, I think I'm like running out of time. I know that was very, um, rapid, but maybe you got the intuition there. Um, and the kind of the cool thing is that when you do that, sorry, I'm skipping a lot, but when you do that, you end up also with a Monte Carlo estimate that has some variance problems. And it turns out that if you combine this autofocus approach with the CBAS approach, it actually automatically bounds this variance. And so these two things play very nicely together, although they don't have to be combined. So, and then again, we have, um, there's some, yeah, I guess I'm running out of time, but there's some just interesting ways to think about this in terms of uh, the bias variance trade-off of the Oracle with respect to the search distribution. And, uh, and then we, again, we have some very simple simulations so that we can try to understand what's happening and we can show as we vary parameters of the simulation, how much we um, do better with auto-focusing versus um, not doing any better. We don't tend to do ever worse. So in general, auto-focusing tends to help. Um, and then we have a more realistic situation based on materials design data where we can show that with different base algorithms, like the one I proposed in the beginning of the talk, DBAS, the second part of the doc, this thing we call CBAS, plus a bunch of other ones that if you bring autofocus into any of these and then you assess it, on the whole, we tend to also just do better with autofocus. So um, I'll, I'm going to stop there. I apologize. The last bit was kind of rushed, but I think that, that my, and this is actually a new slide, which is quite simple. It just says that computational design, so be it in molecular biology and chemistry or wherever, I, I think it poses some really kind of interesting and unique challenges and like a twist to the way we often think about machine learning that are very interesting and very challenging to tackle. And they're mostly arising from the fact that we're purposely pushing the predictive models beyond where they were seen and into the unknown, right? Versus like an example where you like say train radiology on one hospital and you want to deploy to another hospital, like you know the other hospital. We don't know the other hospital here. We're going to like the moon or like to, to Venus, right? And we, but we just have no idea what's out there. And so we have to kind of fundamentally deal with this trade-off between extrapolation and trustworthiness and try to squeeze as much as we can out of that. And so I think this is like an exciting area and, uh, and there's lots more to be done. And, um, right, we have a bunch of actual like really serious, um, impactful collaborations going on. Some are very early stage. This one, um, probably most advanced on the gene delivery with my colleague here, David Schaefer, and this is being led by my student, David Brooks, um, who also did all the first half of this. So the CBAS, DBAS stuff was all David and the autofocus stuff was, uh, was Clara. And okay, I'll stop there because I know I'm out of time. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Jennifer, for the great talk. Um, any questions? I guess uh, we actually do have two questions in the chat. Um, so let me go over them first. Um, so the first question is Anupam Mediv Rata. Um, the question is, how do you get your training data? Can you create synthetic training data to get more coverage? I mean, that's, again, that's sort of very domain specific. So in the project with Dave Schaefer on, where is it? Um, so this one, he's been doing this already for years. He has like a number of startups that we're also starting to work with. And so he has a lot of data. And now what we're doing is we're trying to, we're essentially using these kinds of methods to direct him to generate data in different ways and, to, and, and hopefully end up um, with fewer rounds of directed evolution to get something to the right part of the eye. 
and things like this. But I mean, the data that's just like, you know, GFP is publicly, you can get some of it publicly available. Some of this is totally private data from collaborations. And actually uh, an interesting problem I didn't talk about that we've been thinking a lot, and in particular, we've been working on a little um, offshoot project with Eric on, there was this idea of like, how do you, the cold start problem here, like what if actually I don't know anything and I need to just generate some data to bootstrap myself here? How do I do that? And that's like a really interesting question that we've been thinking a lot about because it's almost like pre-machine learning, but we are trying to do it nevertheless with, with machine learning. Um, anyway, the, the question of where you get data from, this is like totally domain and project specific. So it can't be answered more generally. Thank you. The next question is from Howard Rees. Uh, the question is, are there search distribution families, for example, the Richley uh, distribution that play well with uh, protein fo following modeling? So two comments. We're not actually dealing with protein folding. Um, I know I showed it as an example because I think it nicely represents the, the way that nature is somehow navigating. This, you, so when I build the, when we build these predictive models, historically these have gone through um, sort of folding and then from a fold to a property, but increasingly that's being bypassed with machine learning when there's a, enough data. And so um, we don't have to do that. And then sorry, where is, what was the rest of the question? I sidetracked side myself. Um, uh, is there, oh yeah, so yeah, so this is an interesting question of like which you might ask, like, is there an optimal family that I should use for my problem? And if you think about it, there's a notion of conjugacy between the search model and the predictive model. So imagine you knew, for example, that the predictive model, like one that worked well, imagine you knew that it was linear regression with um, marginal and pairwise terms. Then you could show that um, a generative model which was something like a POTS model would be sort of sufficiently rich and, and things. So there, you can poke at this a little bit under some assumptions, uh, sort of theoretically. And then you can also just ask like empirically, like well, which ones, like given that I have say this neural network uh, Oracle model, like what generative model should I use? And I think that the question is, we ha it's not something we spent a lot of time on again, because this is, kind of going to be domain specific. I don't think there's going to be a super general answer, um, but the, you know, there's a lot of things you can, a VAE is a little problematic because it has an elbow, not a likelihood. Uh, there's some new papers out on normalizing flows for discrete distributions. You, you know, you might be, you can use a mixture of multinomials, mixture of HMs, but I, we have not done our due diligence there because so, so far it hasn't um, been our interest. Uh, but once we hit a collaboration where we need to hit the hit the ground on that, then we're, we'll we'll hammer it a little bit more. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from Iswan Reddle. Um, the question is: Do you see any connections between the autofocus work and the uh, mul uh, I guess multi arm banded formulations? So I don't know too much about multi arm bandit, but to the extent I do, I tend to think of them as active learning problems, more like Bayesian optimization, where you're allowed to make call, like I think you're allowed to pull the arm, right? And actually get a real measurement. And, and that's like getting new data. And we're not getting new data here. So I would say the direct mapping is not so obvious, but you can sometimes reframe one of these to look like the other. So you can, you could think of using Bayesian optimization for what we're doing, even though we're not collecting new data. And so in that sense, then I think similarly, you could think of using multi-armed bandits, but I'm not sure that that's the most useful way to approach this if you're not acquiring new data. Um, Thank you. Um, the next question is from AK. Um, the question is, by materials design, are you coming up with new formulas or new crystal structures that are good at some properties? Yeah, that was, um, so I actually, Claire is the one who found that example and it's like um, superconducting materials. And uh, to be honest, I don't remember the details of the design space that she was using. We have also been talking to some people up at the national labs who have a materials database and they're trying to um, find different compositions of materials uh, and, and, and see how those work. But this is not a space we've gone 
into in a serious manner and don't, are not actively collaborating on. So I don't know too much about it. I know that it's a very active area and that these people are interested in these kinds of, of procedures. And the one we put in our preprint was kind of just um, a way to get a more realistic example in there. And we're working to get a protein example in there as well. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, so while people are thinking, let me ask one question. Um, so in the work on autofocus, um, have you thought about generalization errors of the, um, the, P, of the P sub beta model um, and how to... That's a really good question. Yeah, we make this whole deal of we don't trust the Oracle, but then we just sort of say we trust that thing. I, I think this, it would be nice to think that through more carefully. And if you, if you have any ideas, please like, let's chat. Um, so David, um, who drove the first few papers on, well, is responsible for the first few papers, uh, looked at this a little bit and he, for the problems he was working on, he didn't feel it was much of a concern, but we have been following these papers of like, out of you know outlier detection, out of distribution, like how to the, you know should you use the likelihood? Should you think of the typical set um, and these kinds of things? Um, and 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 we haven't um, done anything with it, and we haven't directly observed it to be problematic. And I I think maybe the reason for that is so so another it's going to sound like it's a different question, but I think there's a, an analogy here. So. I actually wanted to bring these ideas into Bayesian optimization, this idea like in Bayesian optimization, you build a surrogate and then you basically completely assume that surrogate and its uncertainty is correct. And then you create an acquisition function with it and you don't ever doubt it. And so um, I thought, well, maybe this will be helpful there, but I think that everything I described is not quite, I, maybe someone can make it helpful, but the reason I think intuitively it's not that needed there is that you get a chance to self-correct because even if it's wrong, you get a new data point and you get to keep updating. And I think of the search model in a similar manner, like I keep moving it around and somehow it feels to me like even if it's not perfect, I feel like it's not doing something super crazy, which like it's not going to take us to some totally crazy part of the space is my my belief, that's like my intuition, but I, I haven't hammered it out more cleanly than that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, that concludes today's seminar. Let's thank Jennifer again for the very interesting talk.